Hello and welcome to Nikon Report, your weekly roundup for all the latest Nikon news and all other announcements that we found interesting. It's Constantine here. This is Becky. I wanted to tell you that it's nice and sunny in London and that was the case about three minutes ago, but it's pouring rain now. Mm -hmm. I wonder why. Is that <laughs> because Nikon just dropped a teaser 3 for Maybe. Nikon Z9? <laughs> Do you think that's related to the weather? It's quite possible. So first up, it says Z9 is coming, teaser 3. That's the name of the video that Nikon have dropped okay so the question i have for you is z9 coming then i think it's coming okay is the t the three about autofocus it's about speed and autofocus i reckon if you watch it and we'll go through it bit by bit here you will see that one of the biggest points that they're trying to make is that it's fast mm -hmm. and that it can autofocus <laughs> so speed 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 yeah okay so it looks like the autofocus is really good, but what they want to try to tell us that it's not just autofocus, it's actually the tracking of subject and motion. And obviously this teaser is based on a lot of action, isn't it? It is. So this is kind of sporty. We've got people running, playing tennis. We've got some motocross. We've got dirt bikes. We've got cars. It, it tells us a number of things. So first up, we have a quick look at the camera. It doesn't tell us anything else apart of that FTZ adapter is attached to the camera. I wonder what the reason is, Bex. Do you think because they don't have long lenses for Z mount? I mean, I'm sure there's that, yes. But I don't know why they would put an FTZ on there. I don't think that they did that intentionally. That's my thought. But it was just there. It was just there. Just happened to be there. That particular photographer wanted to shoot with his beloved whatever, 400 f2.8 prime. And so he had to use an FTZ. He spent a lot of money on it. That's my, that's my logic. Yeah, if you spend the money, you got to use it, isn't it? Exactly. That's true. Well, let's move to the next one. So we got a motocross section and this guy's coming in, right? Yeah. So it looks like it doesn't track the motorcyclist, but it tracks the bike itself. It does. The little square, the little yellow square is over the top of the bike. So that tells us that much like the rumors suggested, there is vehicle tracking. Vehicle tracking, exactly. So it, was, it wasn't car tracking per, per, per se, it was vehicle tracking. So we've got motorcycle here. In one of the few clips next, we will have a car. That's right. I wonder if it's going to track planes or boats or trains, you know, all sorts of vehicles. Planes, trains and automobiles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's quite possible. I mean, I think the rumors sites originally suggested it was going to be car tracking. Mm -hmm. And I think that that it, the fact that the box is over the the bike means that we'd call it now vehicle track. Yeah, they're going to say, if it's got wheels, we track it. Yeah. Here we go. Planes don't have wheels. They do. I suppose they do. They do. <laughs> they're not like in Flintstones where they need to be taken off. <laughs> they run know. it. Run run with feet. I yeah. mean, I can imagine, yeah, all the passengers put their feet out and then... Run. <laughs> <laughs> and then they have a massive steak from Flintstones <laughs> on a plane. Um, okay, well, the next one up, we're going to have a, a tennis player. Obviously, here we've got the night trek in here. Now, the thing that I like about this is the fact that her movement is super erratic. Like, she ducks to the left and then she jumps when she hits that ball with the racket. That's true. And the racket goes across the face. It does. Yeah. And the whole time, the little square stays over her eyes. That's true. Back in the day, we used to have a 3D tracking yeah. on cameras like D5 and D6, and that would track the subject by color. In this case, it generally, you would set the focusing point on a t-shirt of the tennis player, not the eye. Now, what it tells me here, it's not only tracks it by eye, you can also see it because of the baseball cap, the, the face is in the shadow as well. Yeah, it's true. Which means it's a low contrast situation. It still continues to track the tennis player on the eye and doesn't switch. The question that a lot of people ask, can you switch between the eyes? I don't see why not. I'm sure you can. What it tells me here though, that it's all happening so fast, the same as with motorcycles, mm. it continues to track it. There is pretty much no delay in that focusing square movement. It's pretty much there with the subject. Yeah, it is. I don't see it drop off at any point during that whole sequence. That's very impressive. Absolutely. And then, yeah, the next shot we have runners jumping over obstacles. Mm -hmm. Again, here we have subject going from left to right. We generally, for a lot of autofocus cameras, the tracking from left to the right side, etc., is generally quite straightforward because mm -hmm. the distance change is not that bad. In this case, the lens is focused quite closely. Yeah. So you still need to continue to track it. Again, the question a lot of people ask is, can you switch between the eyes of the different uh, runners? I would assume so. I mean, I don't know if the camera chooses the eye for you and then you consciously make the decision to move it off or whether it's one of those like, let go and then refocus and then it chooses. That's it, true. To be 
to be confirmed. But if you look at Z6 and Z7 cameras, yes, when we have face and eye tracking in, in, enabled in the camera, when there are at least more than one people in the frame, it will have either eye square or face square on one subject in yellow, mm. which means it's the active subject that is tracking, but it also will have a square in white on the, on another face. Mm -hmm. And then if you press the joystick to the left or right, you switch between the faces. You know, I've never used that. That's the thing, because it's generally, it's not as fast as we would want it to be. Yeah, I usually find that by the time I focus on the subject, if it's not who I want, then I'm just like, okay. Exactly. <laughs> but what it tells me here, that's, that's my guess, is that you probably will be able to do exactly the same thing here go from left to right but because the tracking is so fast it's actually may become a lot more usable yeah yeah it's true okay so if I a like lot of that. people ask can you switch i think you can just looking at the performance of uh, the six and the seven cameras but much much faster yeah interesting okay so after we have the sprinters and it follows them going over their obstacles then we have our cars going around the racetrack now this is kind of weird because it doesn't seem to have the box over the whole vehicle mm -hmm. it actually seems to be focusing on the headlights yes. or one side of the headlights is that the eye tracking for cars yeah it's the cars eyes like yeah. lightning mcqueen it's that's like... <laughs> true that's the only reference i have <laughs> is the pixar cars mm -hmm. i don't i don't un quite understand how that works but you do see at the beginning of the sequence that the little square moves from the headlights that are most in view mm -hmm. to suddenly the ones that come into view as the car makes its way around the racetrack so yeah my thinking behind this is when you look at the beginning of the frame i think the left headlights are slightly at the front like slightly closer exactly slightly closer to the frame and then when the car turns it shifts to the other side because now that side becomes closer mm. now because we have vehicle tracking which is pretty much confirmed of course it doesn't show the whole box on the car which i thought that would be the case me too it goes on the headlights, I guess it's something to do with the algorithm, with the tracking algorithm. Right. But it is very interesting. And again, if you look at the speed, how quickly it tracks the light, because cars are moving really fast. So fast. It's not the runners. I mean, they, they run fast, but the cars are moving much faster. So, so if you look at that, again, it's almost a real-time tracking. But yeah, it, it's moving so much faster. If you think about it, it's probably just choosing the closest object mm -hmm. and it's just, yeah, tracking the headlights in this case. The next one up, we got a bit of a football game. And it's a very very split, like very short sequence on the football game. Yeah. You see the the photographer goes from one player to another player. The box shifts from IAF to face AF and then it switches over to the photographer who is a left eye shooter, I'd like to point out. <laughs> well, I'm glad you impo you, you've noticed the important things. Becky. But actually the shift from eye tracking to face tracking is similar to current Z cameras mm. where if camera can't see the eyes or the subject is slightly further away, it basically the square creases to cover the face. And as soon as it can recognize the eyes again, it will become smaller and will track the eye. In this case, the player slightly turns away. Yeah. So his eyes are no longer in the frame. So you can see the profile of the player. Mm -hmm. And that at this moment, it switches to a big square on the face tracking. So again, similar behavior as a current Z6 and Z7 cameras. However, much, much faster, pretty much real time. Yeah, absolutely. Then we get a glimpse of the photographer. Then finally we get that split second view of the Z9 again. Doesn't show us anything, but we get the sprinter running towards us. This is instead. very important. This is probably the biggest sort of sticking point that we have on current Z system cameras yep. is that when the subject is running towards you that's when your tracking generally really lets you down it's not fast enough to keep up with the subject now that's being said we're both using Z6s, Z7s, first gen cameras, Z6 II, Z7 II you've tried and tested. It's better it's still let's say not as fast as this. Yeah, so this really indicates that actually when the subject's moving towards you, you're not going to lose focus, which is what we come to expect. Yeah. Here's a couple of examples that I generally have encountered. Fashion walk. Yes. You generally have photographers, so when the model's walking towards you, yeah. they not running, they're moving quite fast. Yeah. So that's where you need to have fast tracking again because the distance changes so dramatically. It's not the same as going diagonally or from left to right side, etc. Yeah. Another option is Tilly, you know, when we test the 7200 lens with Tilly and my pup, she would run from me and then way towards me. Obviously, she would run a lot faster. Yes. And again, if you look at this sprinter here, he runs a lot faster. And it seems that camera is tracking it real time again. And then we hear the shutter clicks. Yes. And those are very fast. 
<laughs> yeah, like it is serious machine gun. I thought that the D6 was machine gun speed because it's 14 frames per second. Mm -hmm. This is faster. It yeah. sounds faster. So do you reckon 14 and a half? 15 maybe 15 yeah something 20, like that 30 could be 40. i've heard i've heard lots of rumored numbers and i i honestly don't know what this is but it's fast i mean it's at least d6 speed but i'm expecting it would probably be faster because it's a mirrorless camera you don't actually need to have a mechanical shutter mechanism. That's right, yeah. So it could be even faster still. So do you reckon it's electronic shutter and actually what you hear is the, just the sound that is built into the camera? I guess, I don't know, actually. I mean, that sounds like a mechanical shutter. That's true. Yeah. It's just, it's way faster than the D6, isn't it? When you listen to it like that. D6 can retire, I think. Wow. Had a good life. Golly gosh. Ultimately, it sounds like it's going to be a very versatile camera. We've seen it work for sports and wildlife. We've seen, what was the first one? It works for sort of fashion, fashion. With the white dots on the eyes. <laughs> fashion portraiture. And now Nikon is saying, look, it's great for sports of all kinds. Okay. Are you excited, Becky? I am excited. I'm looking forward to seeing... Uh, I mean, I assume that there's going to be another teaser next week because yes. uh, they well, did I'll, with the DF, they did four, right? That's true. Well, I'll tell you more. So according to Nikon Rumors, they say Z9 will be announced on 28th of October, plus minus one day. Right. So that's like around next week-ish. So that's around next week. That's next Thursday. So if we have a teaser next Wednesday, yeah, and then the announcement the next couple of days, then yeah. it's going to be it. Yeah. Wow. All that uh, all that build up. Absolutely. I think I just might take a couple of days off, you know, go fishing. Uh, you won't be able to, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'll come back and it's going to be a whole new world. Yeah. The exactly. before and after Z9. The next one up, Nikon released an 18 to 140 lens last week, which we talked about in the podcast. Just say, hey, they released it. Here's the specifications. Go check it out. Now we have a little bit more information about it. We do. Now we've actually got the specs. Uh, so the 18 to 140 is a DX lens for the Z system. This is the third native DX lens in the Z range. So do you say that they actually release DX lenses? Yeah, someone was saying that Nikon weren't supporting the DX system, but that's a lie, obviously. So <laughs> no, it's it's obviously it's quite understandable that they're not going to release a proper prime lenses so or let's say proper telephoto DX lenses for this range because they say if you want something professional, then we have a full frame range which exactly. you can add on. Exactly. But 18 to 140, 16 to 15, 50 to 50 answers the question of okay, we want want an entry-level cameras with a, something that we can put on the camera and just go ahead and shoot some pictures and 18 to 140 I guess should cover both ranges and according to just the size and weight it looks like it should perform slightly better than the both lenses combined Who yeah knows? yeah exactly I mean 18 to 140 in full frame terms is about 27 to 200 yeah. Yeah. so and if you think about it then we have 24 to 200 z lens uh, for full frame camera so yeah this is effectively does the same thing but smaller lights and specifically designed for DX cameras. Yeah, so if you've got a Z50 or a ZSC, or if Nikon decide to bring out the Z30 or the Z90 that we talk about quite often on the Nikon Report, then this is probably going to be a nice companion for it. I'm personally thinking this would work also quite well if you want a go-anywhere lens for shooting video, because yes, it's a travel lens for your Z50. I like the 16-50 to as a, as a kind of almost slip-in-the-pocket solution, yes. if you've got big pockets, um, but... I do miss having a one lens solution to That's true. everything. And for camera like this, you probably would want a lens like this because yeah, yeah you don't want to change the lens. You just want to get one camera in the lens and just start taking pictures. Uh, a lot of people were concerned of small aperture of 6.3 instead of 5.6 compared to F mount release. To be honest with you, just knowing the lens that they were released for Z mount, yes, maybe the aperture is a bit smaller. I do expect it to outperform 18 to 140 F mount hands down. Just looking at the all the Z lens releases, they were quite nice and sharp um, and definitely better than the F mount equivalent. Yeah, you know what we should do actually is when this lens arrives, I've already forgotten the date that it's coming out. It's 5th of November. Remember, remember. So what we should do when this lens becomes available is compare it with the F mount version. That's true. And with, so someone asked me the other day, why didn't they do an 18 to 200? Well, this is a great question. Why didn't they do an 18 to, why didn't they do an 18 to 300 even? That's true. But the fact is that in the last sort of seven or eight years that this lens, that the F mount 18 to 140 has been out, it has actually outsold most of those other go everywhere lenses. And 
it's a kit lens option, like a premium kit range mm -hmm. option, I would say, for some of the more serious DX users. So yes. I think that's why they've chosen this focal range. It also keeps the lens nice and small and light because the 24 to 200 is not as small. That's true. As you would like it to be, maybe. I personally think that we will see 18 to 200 or 18 to 300 released at some point in the future. Mm. But I think what Nikon clearly tells us that if you're looking at native DX lenses, they will be a keen enthusiast entry level lenses. Mm. And if you want to have, let's say, your D500 equivalent, which is Z90 rumored, then you will have full range of full frame or focus lenses that would work nicely with that top of the range DX camera. But at the moment, the native DX lenses will be designed for more of a kind of travel photography entry level kind of thing what i also want to say is that it is quite light at 315 grams mm. that's not bad at all no it's also got five stop vr which that's pretty good which means you know definitely a good option for hand holding for movie shooting but it also means that if you are doing long distance uh, travel in low light anything like that relationships <laughs> long distance relationships <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then you've got your five stop VR. This is this is what shows us that it's a not professional lens is that they say 7.8 times zoom, which oh. is what they translate focal lengths and that's stuff. not my language at all. I, no. I don't understand this when they say 1000 zoom. It's like, well, can you tell me the focal distance, please? Yes. So it's got a 7.8 times zoom for those uh, compact system users that know what that means. I think that's Pretty That's decent. pretty good. So it comes out on 4th of November. Do you think it's going to be a good lens for Guy Fawkes Night? Uh, gosh, Guy Fawkes Night. We should probably do something for that, actually. Yeah. Now I was thinking about it. Burn the parliament. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Negan Report. <laughs> Negan Field Report. <laughs> uh, yes, you know, last, last bonfire night? Was it last year? Probably the year before. Z50 came out the year yes. before. I took the Z50 and the 16 to 50 to, to the Parliament bonfire night. <laughs> <laughs> no, not to uh, not to do my own gunpowder plot. Yeah, I'm glad that Nikon recognizes uh, our British holidays. Yes. And releases lenses for them. <laughs> so if you haven't bought one, you can pre-order one and get it before the bonfire night. I will say that the closest focusing distance of 20 centimeters at the widest end and 40 centimeters at the longest end means that it will be really it's going to be a good all-round happy option for some that's many pretty good absolutely yeah. because yeah um a lot of that lenses now can focus quite closely i've noticed that's yes. really nice yeah. we also have the 28 millimeter f 2.8 special edition available as a standalone now so we were talking about that we were saying come on nikon you can get it in japan on its own you can get yeah. it in the us on its own now we can get it in the UK on its own. That's true. Speaking of which, so obviously we know that ZFC 28 release has been delayed in Japan because of the drama last week. So and they're expecting it on something like 19th of November. Now in UK, those kits are still out of stock, but they do come through. But apparently in the United States, they're freely available from the dealers. So it looks like the situation improves. And that's why we are starting to see the sales of this lens uh, separately from the camera. Yes. And you can mention that the 28 millimeter lens will also be available in the modern version. So with a 40 millimeter skin on it. So, uh, but if you do want to get a retro version, I think it's a good time to get one now before they replace it with a standard version. Yeah, absolutely. Mm, mm, mm. Another one bites the dust. <laughs> Another one bites the dust. The Nikon 60mm Micro f 2.8D has been officially discontinued in the United Kingdom. Uh, the source emails to the dealers, they saying that you can't order no more. Yeah, sorry, all your back orders have been cancelled. That's true. The G version, however, is available. So if you need a good macro, F-mount macro, 60G, that's where it's at. Really good lens for stills photography, so something like coins, watches, you name it. The next one up, we have some firmware updates. Yes. So we got two updates for Z62 and Z72 cameras. Not the ones that have been rumored, but the 1.30 firmware had a few changes there. So the new addition for both cameras is the portrait impression balance function. That's a new item that appears in photo shooting menu and movie menus mm. and allows you to create up to three hue and brightness adjustment modes to adjust skin tones. 
As part of the new feature, Nikon has also published a new portrait and wedding photography guide for those cameras where the function is described in detail. So if you do want to read more about this, do definitely check out this PDF that we have in the link below. Excellent. Okay, so a couple of additional points that they've added to this firmware update. The monitor now shows the shooting display at all times when tilted, when on is selected for image mm. review in the playback menu. They've also fixed the following issues. Custom setting F4, which is aperture lock in the custom settings menu was not available when the FTZ mount adapter was attached. Also, although focus would normally remain locked if the AF on button was kept pressed while the shutter release button was used to take a series of pictures, the camera would refocus without input from the AF on button if shooting was suspended with very specific parameters. The flash ready light on the SB5000 flash units would not light if a WRR10 or WRR11B was used for wireless remote flash photography. Yeah, and then we have also Z6 two specific change so it's unfortunately not applied to Z7 two yet uh, the voice memo has been added to the options available in custom settings F2 Yay. remember voice memo on Z6 which was added with the last firmware um, a month ago or so so now this option came to Z6 Mark II not sure why Z7 and Z7 II were left out of this so fingers crossed hopefully they can bring this functionality into the camera but at the moment Z6 II is the only camera that has this option now one thing to be aware um, some users at Nikon Rumors, so there's one called Andy. He says, I just updated my Z7 II to 130 firmware and my Tech Art TZE01 adapter with Sigma 2470 failed to communicate. Well, it did work with 1.21 and 120 firmware, so he had to downgrade. So if you got a Tech Art adapter, then you may want to just leave this firmware and hopefully the next firmware will fix the issue um, again. There are not many of you around, but do be aware of that. We also had new firmware updates released for the Nikon WR-R11A and WR-R11B remote controllers. The changes include the end pairing process has been improved to make it easier to end pairing. Okay, you know how sometimes it's quite difficult to pair Bluetooth devices? Yes. And when it works, it just works. And somehow they pair with each other in five seconds and everyone is happy. Magic. Sometimes they don't pair and that's where all the problems start. And then you can spend half an hour cycling through different settings trying to figure out how do things work. So normally we recommend just reset everything and then hopefully it works again. So that firmware should improve that process and hopefully you'll have more chances of items being paired straight away. And another one, as we mentioned before, so the SB5000 flash ready light will operate when using WR10 and W11B transmitters. So that's another fix that they added to this firmware. Nice. Uh, next up, Nikon products receive the Good Design Award of 2021. So the winning products were the Nikon ZFC for premium exterior and customizable color options. Ooh. The uh, 10 by 25 stabilized binoculars, the upright microscope, Eclipse SI. Oh, the famous microscope that we talk about all the time. We do, every couple of weeks. Um, if you would like to have a look at those design awards, we'll include a link in the description box and in the podcast notes for you. Absolutely. And the couple of news that we don't understand. So Nikon announces development of the NSR-S636E ARF immersion scanner. Yeah, so this is an immersion scanner which will deliver superior overlay accuracy and ultra high throughput to support manufacturing of the most critical semiconductor devices that are out of stock everywhere and it's, there's shortage of them yeah it's great so if you want to read more about this do check it out in the link below and then also Nikon opened their first European bioimaging lab which was open in Leiden Netherlands Takaharu Sasaoka director and executive vice president had this to say. We are very excited to be located here in the Leiden Bioscience Park, the largest life sciences cluster in the Netherlands. And I would like to thank all the organizations that helped Nikon Europe BV locate and develop this partnership. Following the success of our Nikon bioimaging labs in the US and Japan, NBIL Leiden will provide services for microscope-based imaging and analysis to the European biotech, pharma, and larger research communities. It's very good. Hey, science. Right. Okay. Let's get on to the third party news. Voigtlander announced another F-mount lenses. So it's a 90mm f2.8 SL Mark II lens. Excellent. While other companies discontinued F-mount lenses, Voigtlander announced a new one. Because why not? This one is 90mm, so it uh, looks 
like it's going to be a nice portrait lens. It's incredibly compact is is it's yeah. kind of cute. And it looks quite a lot like an AIS lens or actually an AI, no. pre-AI pre -AI, lens. like a nice color printed. It looks beautiful. Yeah. Good job, Voigtlander. Right. I would just buy one to put on shelf and never use it. How much are they? That's a good question. Let's find out. Um, because like that, I love the fact they've also put it on a DF, which is cool. As like, but is it plastic? Nah, it's all metal. It's I'm pretty metal. sure it's all metal. Voigtlander doesn't deal with plastic. Six ninety nine. It's not cheap. It's also not expensive. No, it's a happy medium for a ninety mil lens, I reckon. Seven Artisans also released a twenty five millimeter f zero point nine five APS C lens for the Nikon Z mount. Okay, so this is DX lens, and that's twenty five f zero point ninety five. So very shallow depth view. Yes. TechArt that we mentioned before will soon announce a new TZG zero one context G to Nikon Z AF lens adapter yeah so this is an adapter that is metal made with inner flocking to reduce reflections uh, af support including afc and iaf the review says that it is fairly quick and accurate for static subjects and also decent for slow moving targets there is a tab on the adapter for manual focusing it does provide exif metadata support and there are some sample shots. So if you want to have a little look at that, we'll put a link in the description box in the podcast notes. Absolutely. Now, it made me think about that FTZ adapter that was on Z9 teaser. Do you reckon? It's the FTZ too. Yeah. I mean, there's been no, we haven't heard any more apart from that one rumor. That's true. And that little frame that we have there is such a tight angle, so you can't really see much. You, you can see it's an adapter, but you don't really see if it's any different or not. No, we assume it's a Nikon adapter, of course, yes. as opposed to some other brand. But yeah, it's it's a good question. All yeah. right. Well, hopefully we don't have to wait for long to find out. Yeah. Let's move on to review section. DP review, publisher review to 1424 f2.8 SZ lens by Mike Tompkins. It's a field review, so they actually used it before reviewing it. Yes, he did say it was lightweight and compact for its class. Comprehensive weather sealing. Those are things that he liked about it. Very sharp and free of most optical aberrations. Uh, works well for video too. Some of the things that he didn't like uh, were things like wide open sharpness drops off quickly as you move away from the image center. Bokeh can be distracting due to soap bubble effect. Mm. Do you know what the soap bubble effect is? Well, it just looks a little bit busy, a little right. bit nervous. You know, it's not a creamy battery like you would have on a portrait lenses, which I wouldn't expect an amazing shallow depth of field bokeh from super wide angle lens. It is there and obviously it allows you to close quite uh, closely to the subject. So you, you focus could, could be like something like 20 25 centimeters and that will create a shallow depth of field mm. but of course i wouldn't expect it to be as good as let's say something like 50 mil lens or 85 millimeter lenses yeah exactly but all in all a nice well-rounded review so do check that out if you have a moment in other news, we had uh, quite a few things happen. So Adobe Camera Raw is coming to Photoshop on the iPad. They've released a small teaser ahead of Adobe Max 2021, which will happen later this month. I think it's next week. Basically, they showed a small video where they edit a raw file on iPad, which is quite nice. Is it? Well, if you travel, yes, then it's really good. You see, for me, I don't really use iPad for any critical application, photography-wise. Mm. So it's a good browser, obviously, and there's a, you can obviously draw on it, you can uh, add keyboard on it, etc., etc. Cetera, et cetera. I mean, uh, iPads are not. This is an Apple podcast, but they are an incredibly powerful tool. Yes. Actually, they're 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 like little computers. I will find myself just using my iPad for most things, but I've never edited pictures on it that's the thing and lightroom for ipad currently it's not very good in my opinion well it's not it's a bit good limited. exactly compared to full frame desktop version yeah and that's why for something location and critical i would use a macbook yes understandable so with the raw feature added to it yeah. Who knows what they'll add to the Photoshop and Lightroom next. So potentially, I think we definitely will see improvement there and they will become better and better for this type of use. Speaking of Apple, they had an event on 18th of October last week where they announced new MacBooks. They did. So we got M1 Pro processor and also M1 Max processor available in 14 um, inches and 16 inches screen. First redesigned since I think 2016. Mm. Uh, which is really nice. I know you said because you were looking forward to a new Mac Mini and they haven't announced one. No, very sad, but it's okay. Yeah, you're going to wait for another year? 
<laughs> it'll take me that long to save up for one of these MacBook yeah. Pros. <laughs> That's right. They are expensive, but I think it's one of the first times where I see that the expense is justified because generally we all were prepared or not prepared to pay Apple tax. So we would pay premium for Apple devices. That mm. was just expected. In this case, I think they're pushing technology so far enough. Mm that actually it's really good for what you get. Yes, it's expensive, but specification, just the process itself and the speed, it just feels like it's going to be a very capable machine. Of course, we still have to wait for the non-official benchmarks, so for independent benchmarks. So hopefully we will start to see them next week. So before making a decision, do wait for this. But the Nikon official benchmarks look really good. I mean, the, the Apple ones. The Apple ones. Not, oh, Nikon. not Nikon one, no. The official Apple benchmarks do look really good. Obviously, they won't make them look bad anyway. But um, no. it's Nation one. I am excited. I can't afford one, but who knows? For your weekend read and watch segment, we have the Nikon Nippon Kugaku W Nikkor C 2.5 centimeter F4. LTM, Nikon's Tiny Gems Part 3 by Agata Urbaniak at 35 MMC. That's a great blog if you haven't uh, already encountered it before on your travels. It's a great little review about some very obscure lenses. So go and have a read of that if you get a moment. All right, we have a couple of videos for you to recommend. The first one was recommended by our viewer Richard, um, who recommended us to have go to Amazon Prime and watch a documentary called McCullen and it's about Don McCullen and his war photography. Very interesting video. So if you're into photojournalism in general, I do recommend to watch it, but do be aware for some strong disturbing images. Uh, speaking of photojournalism, Nikon has a video on their YouTube channel, which is called The Power of Photography. Nikon Forges shares their stories. And that's the video of the interviewing, um, I think, three or four photographers who just tell him how they use Nikon cameras in their professional field. Get your box of tissues out. It's a moving one. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching and or listening. If you are watching us on YouTube, please give us a like and a subscribe. That would be great. If you are listening to us on a podcast platform, a review would be lovely and certainly a follow. Absolutely. It's going to be a busy week for us creating all the content because there's so many news now with all the things that are happening in the background. Then we really need your views and your likes because that just makes us happy to create the content for you. It does. Thank you very much and we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.